So our record of our own personal experience is a crucial uh, component of who we are and defines in many ways uh, how we see ourselves. And this has come to be called episodic memory, our memory for our own personal experience. And over the last five or six decades, we've begun to understand uh, really uh, in increasing detail how episodic memory depends on the brain and how the brain allows mechanisms in the brain allow us to remember what has happened to us. This research um, had a great um, step forward in the 1950s when, when Brenda Milner uh, was studying patient uh, Henry Molaison, often known as patient HM, who had uh, developed complete amnesia following surgery uh, to cure his intractable epilepsy, which removed parts of both of his hippocampi. Now, the hippocampus is a part of the brain uh, under in the middle of the temporal lobes in here, which uh, is often tends to be the focus for epilepsy. And uh, William Scoville, the, the neurosurgeon, had removed the anterior part of both of his hippocampi to cure epilepsy. The operation was successful in terms of treating the epilepsy, but uh, as Brenda Milner found out, he seemed to have lost all ability to form new memories and, in fact, had uh, lost his ability to remember what had happened to him prior to the surgery going back uh, many years. So uh, she referred to this loss of memory, um, simply as loss of memory, what the man in the street would call memory, the ability to remember what has happened to you. But subsequent research, uh, much of it by herself and by other collaborators, uh, has come to uh, specify in more detail the various different things that we can mean by memory. So for example, semantic memory reflects your knowledge for f knowledge of facts um, and knowledge of, of how things are, uh, whereas procedural memory uh, relates to your ability to do things like riding a bicycle. And the key aspect of episodic memory that seems to depend on the hippocampus um, Endel Tulving, the philosopher, characterized as an ability to re-experience what happened. So you can remember what you had for lunch yesterday, perhaps by thinking back and to some extent re-experiencing or imagining what happened and you can maybe imagine who was there and where you were and what things looked like and what they tasted like. And this re-experience is characteristic of episodic memory. For example, you know some facts but you don't re-experience the uh, event when you learned that fact and you can ride a bicycle, but you may have forgotten the early experiences you had uh, learning to do that. And so uh, with episodic memory, we, we knew from, from Brenda Milner's work that it depends on the hippocampus. So over the years, we've uh, begun to make some progress in understanding what it is that happens in the brain that enables episodic memory or this ability to re-experience what has happened to us in the past. And much work uh, also um, concerning the hippocampus as it happened from uh, neuroscientists in the uh, early 1970s, Tim Bliss and Teje Lomo, were uh, interested in the electrical uh, connections between neurons or the uh, synaptic connections between neurons which allow them to send little electrical signals to each other. And it turned out, as had been predicted by uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal at the turn of the last century, and Donald Hebb in around uh, the 1950s, that if um, two neurons are both uh, sending uh, little electrical signals and they have a connection between them, then this connection can get stronger. And this is the ultimate basis, we think, of, of our ability to remember things, because if, if uh, experiences are represented in the brain by these neurons sending little electrical signals uh, to each other, then the pattern of activity across the neurons for a given event, perhaps when you're eating your lunch the other day, that can be captured by strengthening the connections between all of the neurons that were active, in the sense that if those connections have been strengthened, now at a later date, if I reactivate some of those neurons, perhaps by reminding you of the name of the person that you had lunch with, then the activity of those neurons can reactivate the other neurons via these strengthened connections and therefore recreate, uh, retrieve the pattern of activity that you had at the time. And this brings us to the hippocampus. So as the mathematician David Marr pointed out in the early 1970s also. So the hippocampus being in the middle of the brain and getting inputs from all of the different sensory areas for vision and touch and hearing and taste and so on is well positioned to make these changes in connection strengths between neurons that could be representing the whole event of your having lunch yesterday. So the visual 
uh, input can drive some neurons uh, from visual cortex, but eventually in the hippocampus itself, and the tastes and sounds can drive other neurons to be active in the hippocampus, where they're all close together and all share a lot of uh, potential connections. And these connections can then be strengthened so that you've laid down a memory for the event there of having, having lunch. And now in future, if some of these neurons are reactivated, they can reactivate the other neurons and they can in turn reactivate neurons back in these sensory areas that can recreate the experience of the taste and the sound and the sights and so on of, of that event. And so our basic model of, of episodic memory comes from this work by David Marr in the 1970s suggesting that the hippocampus contains this ability to reactivate the initial pattern that was stored uh, when you experienced the event and this can allow us to re-experience that event. Now there's some extra controversy about whether um, if you store a memory for a very long time whether this still depends on the hippocampus or whether other parts of the brain can actually slowly increase connections between appropriate neurons to do that task without the hippocampus because um, as I said at the beginning the patient HM after he lost his hippocampus still appeared to be able to remember some things from from well back before he had the um, the surgery on his, on his hippocampi. So it's possible that other parts of the brain can step in and help you to remember very old memories uh, as well. But that's our, our basic uh, understanding of how episodic memory can work. And so when we start to think about the actual um, details of what happens when you try and re-experience uh, what happened, it becomes clear that um, we need to understand how things are represented like the, the scene that you would have seen around you when you were having when you're having lunch. Through a series of uh, different developments, uh, understanding how neurons in the hippocampus and in surrounding areas can represent where you are and how the environment is laid out around you, we can now begin to have a uh, neural level mechanistic understanding of what happens when you, when you use your episodic memory to remember uh, what happened. So for example, place cells uh, discovered by John O'Keefe indicate where you are and can be stored to indicate where you were. The pattern of activity can be stored to indicate where you were when you were having this lunch or when whatever event it was happened. And head direction cells uh, discovered by Jim Rank also in the same memory system can um, they represent where you were, which way you were facing. And again if that activity can be stored via strengthening connections between uh, neurons as, as I described before. Then we can begin to see how when you want to remember what happened when you were having lunch, you can reactivate a representation of where you were and which way you were facing, and also from there reactivate uh, lots of other representations of um, information held in the brain near to the hippocampus, such as where buildings were around you and where objects were near to you. And in that way you can build up a, an image, if you like, of the spatial scene around you and we can understand how that uh, process would happen at the level of individual neurons and we explained this in a, in a computational model uh, that I made with uh, Sue Becker who was visiting from Canada uh, in, in 2001. So we can begin to understand what individual neurons are doing to uh, enable you to reimagine what happened or re-experience the event is, is how El Endel Tulving would, would put it. But of course it's important to know that this is not exactly like re-experience. It may be much less detailed and indeed it might be incorrect. So our memory is notoriously fallible. When you try and remember what happened at lunch you may get some aspects wrong. But this mechanism that we've identified, what it will do is make sure that of all the things that you could retrieve, all the kinds of information you could retrieve, what you retrieve is actually consistent with what you could experience from that location where you're in because of the connections between all the neurons representing information and the place cells which are rep representing you being in that one location. And information that is consistent with you having a particular viewpoint by connections that have been strengthened to head direction cells that indicate a particular viewpoint. And so what this mechanism will do is uh, enforce the creation of a coherent spatial scene around you in your mind's eye when you imagine what happened. It may be filled in with bits of uh, information that have been incorrectly retrieved and may not be veridical, but it explains how you imagine what happened before. 
at the level of neurons. And of course, other parts of the brain are involved, uh, particularly the parietal lobe at the back here, represent where things are left and right and straight ahead of you. And indeed, if you want to um, make actions to, to tell you how to move uh, left and right uh, and operate on the environment, whereas these memory representations in and around the hippocampus are more abstract what is to the north, what was to the left, what was to the uh, west or so on of me. And you have to translate that into what would have been left or right of you, given your facing direction, what was left and, and right of you. If, I'm, if I was facing north and there was a building to the west, then it will be on my left. But if I was facing south, and if I want to imagine facing south, then obviously I would imagine that building being on my right when I make a visual image that I can use to imagine what had happened. We're now able to sort of make a neural level um, model, computational model of, of exactly how we can retrieve the spatial scene around a given event, or indeed imagine a new spatial scene. We could construct a coherent spatial scene using these mechanisms, even for something that hadn't happened. If we want to imagine something happening in the future, for perhaps to plan what we should do, we can perhaps imagine what it would be like and then see if that was a, a good idea or not. Uh, colleagues uh, here at UCL, uh, Eleanor Maguire and Dennis, uh, Demis Hassabis, um, showed indeed in 2007 that um, patients with damage to the hippocampus find it difficult to imagine coherent spatial scenes, showing that their, their deficit is not just in memory, but also in this ability to imagine coherent scenes um, of what could be around them. So I think this, this work um, can lead on, hopefully, to making a more mechanistic understanding of what can go wrong, uh, for example, in disorders of memory like post-traumatic stress disorder, where we get these um, scenes or reactivations or flashbacks which are not under our control, or indeed in Alzheimer's disease where other aspects of episodic memory seem to um, be some of the first things that we can no longer do as we begin to get um, Alzheimer's. Or perhaps even in, in in terms of schizophrenia and other disorders where we might get hallucinations or, or incorrect perceptions or imaginations that don't relate to what we want to imagine or what we should actually perceive.